Let me welcome our next speaker, Nadine Burke Harris from Center for Youth Wellness. Um, so, uh, Dr. Harris's um, presentation is titled "Aces and Toxic Stress: From Research to Practice to More Research: A Clinician A Clinician's Call to Action." Thank you so much. Thank you, Jack, for your wonderful comments. And um, I uh, would like to start, you know, you asked the question, where did Einstein get the creativity? And when I hear that, I think to myself, necessity is the mother of invention. When I think about how I came to this work, it really was from seeing patients in clinic. And so, I want to take you into clinic, uh, into the exam room with me so that you guys will have an opportunity to feel what I'm feeling when I see patients every day. A couple years ago, um, uh, a patient came in to see me. He was a seven-year-old boy. This is not him for HIPAA reasons, but uh, imagine I'm doing the same thing, right? Uh, seven-year-old boy who was brought in to see me by his mom because his, uh, for an evaluation for ADHD, the teacher asked, her to bring him in because uh, she was worried he had ADHD and uh, wanted to see if medications would be helpful. So I did my job. I did a thorough history and physical and a couple things I observed. First of all, his, his skin was dry and inflamed. Uh, so it looked like he had some eczema. When I put my stethoscope on his chest, I could hear like a distinct wheezing. And um, so it was clear. And when I asked mom about it, she said, oh, yeah, yeah, he's, you know, he's had this really bad asthma, it's been difficult for us to control. But the weird thing about my exam was that the kid was short, right? Real short. In fact, he was seven years old at the time, but uh, when I plotted his height on the growth chart, he was the 50th percentile for a four-year-old. So, um, but mom was there to talk about the ADHD, and so, as I was probing deeper into the history, you know, is his behavior the same as at, and at school? Uh, you know, when did this begin? Did you notice, has, it, has he always been like this? Or um, did you notice that it happened at any particular time? And when I asked that question, mom broke down into tears. And I had to send the patient and his sister to wait in the, uh, in the waiting room. And mom told me that um, a couple years before, because they could not afford their rising rent in San Francisco, she took in a boarder to, uh, to rent out one of the rooms, help pay the rent. And uh, one day she came home and found this man sexually assaulting her son. He was four years old at the time, and since then, he's been having these terrible problems. So immediately I thought to myself, okay, I don't think I'm necessarily dealing with ADHD, and I don't know that a stimulant or an amphetamine derivative is going to be helpful here. Seems like there may be some trauma at the root of this. So, you know, I'm going to refer him to therapy. And as I was dealing with the rest of his symptoms, I'm like, okay, but now I've got to deal with the eczema and the asthma and the, and the, you know, the growth failure. So, you know, I did a bunch of labs trying to figure out why this kid was so short. Didn't find anything. So when I was on the phone with the endocrinologist, uh, you know, we ended up doing a bone age, which is an x-ray of the left wrist to evaluate the skeletal maturity. And the bone age came back 50th percentile mean for a four-year-old child. So I'm on the phone with the endocrinologist. I'm like, tell me if I'm crazy, but have you ever heard of this? The mom, this mom is telling me that this kid has a history of severe trauma at the age of four. And it seems like he has some kind of growth arrest is it, have you ever heard of this or am I just wacko? And she was, and she said, no, this is, this has been a demonstrated phenomenon, trauma-induced growth failure. And in, and in fact, often what you see is you don't see um, results, uh, abnormal labs, but the kid doesn't grow. And the best treatment is therapy. They have to get over the trauma before they can, um, uh, as a, before they'll resume growth. So it, it, for that patient, I would love to say that this was such 
a shocking and a striking example. Certainly his clinical presentation was striking, but his history sadly was not. I was seeing that over and over and over again in my patient population in Bayview Hunters Point, which was a severely underserved, uh, violent neighborhood in San Francisco. And so when my colleague introduced me to the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, um, it, it, it blew my mind. It helped to show the scope and scale of the problem. And I think for those, just I'll do the show of hands. How many people are familiar with the ACE study? We heard a little bit about it from Jack. So most folks, for anyone who's not familiar, this was done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente. They looked at 10 categories of adversity, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, or household dysfunction, including parental mental illness, substance dependence, incarceration, parental se separation or divorce, or domestic violence. So for every yes, for every category someone experienced, you get a point on your A score. And the two things that they found were incredibly striking. Number one, ACEs are super common. 67% of their population had at least one ACE, and 12.6% percentage percent of their population had four or more adverse childhood experiences, right? And we heard from Jack that this was not a low income uh, inner city population. This was done at Kaiser San Diego in a population that was 70% college educated, 70% um, Caucasian. So then the next thing that they found was that there was a dose response relationship between adverse childhood experiences and numerous health problems as we, um, as we heard from Jack. So a person with an A score of four or more was 390%, right? Almost four times, 3.9 times as likely to have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as a person with a score of zero. If we look at the 10 leading causes of death in the United States, what we see is that having an A score of four or more is dramatically, not a little bit, dramatically increases the risk of disease, right? So for heart disease, twice the risk. Cancer, almost twice. COPD, almost four times. Stroke, more than twice. Alzheimer's, more than four times. This is of the, these are the 10 leading causes of death in the United States of America, right? Suicide, 12 times. And then when we look, what percentage of the population is affected? There are now 30 states that collect ACE data as part of their behavioral risk factor surveillance system. And not all of them report their data, but of the ones that they do, you know, Derek Ford, the guy who collects this from the CDC, he said, they all look roughly like this. At least 50% of the population have uh, at least one ACE, and between 13 and 17% of the population with four or more ACEs. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that constitutes a public health emergency. We're talking about a huge percent of the population that has uh, significantly increased risk for the leading causes of death in the United States. So the question is, what do we do about it, right? So previously, the, you know, the dominant thinking was, well, you grow up in a rough neighborhood, you have you know, bad parenting, you're more likely to drink and smoke and do all the things that will uh, damage your health, right? So this is, I'm really sorry that happened to you, but you should take better care of yourself, and um, you know, that's why these folks are in the situation that they're in. And the good news is that uh, we have smart scientists like the ones in this room who are able to debunk that. First of all, uh, when, when you do the logistic regression analysis to control for health damaging behavior, it only attenuates between 40 to 50% of the risk, right? So if you have seven or more ACEs, the relative risk of ischemic heart disease, number one killer in the United States, is 360%. But if you remove, if you don't, if you don't smoke, you don't overeat, you remove all these health damaging behaviors, that only attenuates 50% of the risk. And that helps us, on, and, and I will say, the one other thing I wanna add is, it's not that straightforward. In addition, if you have high ACEs, 
you're at greater risk for engaging in health damaging behaviors. And that also has a biological basis, right? Which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But this is where understanding the mechanism and some of the things that we just heard Jack talk about is so important. So when I see Diego in front of me in clinic, and I am beginning to, and I see that he's at risk for all of these things, right? I, as his doctor, what do I do? Well, it starts with understanding the biology of adversity, figuring out, okay, how do I interrupt these pathways, right? So you're walking in the forest, and you see my friend here, right? <laughs> so, what, so what happens? Immediately, right, your brain understands the stressor, and activates two pathways, your HPA axis, which triggers your adrenal cortex to, re to release cortisol, and your SAM axis, which triggers your adrenal medulla to release adrenaline and noradrenaline. And that is, and that mediates all the effects that we think about with the stress response, right? Your heart starts to pound, your pupils dilate, your blood pressure shoots up so that you are ready to either fight the bear or run from the bear. And that's wonderful if you're in a forest and there's a bear. But the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night, right? Or if the bear is waiting for you when you get off the bus in the morning. And this process is activated over and over and over and over again. And we know that it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to being maladaptive or health damaging. And it affects just about every system in the developing child, right? We see structural and functional changes in stress-sensitive parts of the brain, including the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. We see loss of feedback inhibition, right? Normally, you have high levels of adrenaline, uh, noradrenaline, and cortisol, and they feed back on the part of the brain that shuts off the stress response. But, we see, but with toxic stress, we see loss of the feedback inhibition. We see down-regulation or uh, decreased activation of the prefrontal cortex, which is the exact part of the brain that's necessary for uh, learning and executive functioning. Uh, we see toxicity of the hippocampus and dysregulation of the reward center of the brain. This is the ventral tegmental area of the nucleus accumbens. This part of the brain is responsible, is the area where substances of addiction act. So it's an area that's stimulated by cocaine, heroin, you know, all these. And we see dysregulation of this serotonin circuit in the reward center of the brain so that people get less pleasure from pleasurable activities. So they need to do more and more. And what, what is it that they uh, say? It's hard to get enough of something that almost works, right? And so we see this dramatically increase risk of uh, substance dependence and health damaging behavior. So this, when you lose a loss of feedback inhibition, leads to long-term activation of stress hormones in the body, like adrenaline and cortisol, right? And it turns out that that also activates the immune system. Almost every part of your immune system is, is exquisitely sensitive to the impact of cortisol um, and cortisol type uh, compounds, right? And so this chronic, this dysregulation of the stress response leads to increased inflammatory mediators, right? So increased chronic inflammation, but then also impaired cell mediated and acquired immunity, right? So your immune system is all out of whack and ultimately an altered microbiome, which is all of our gut bacteria. From the cardiovascular side, what we see is um, uh, there was a great study that looked actually in young people. They looked at 13 to 24 year olds. And what they found was elevated levels of a peptide, right, a protein called endothelin-1. Endothelin-1 is essentially associated with increased blood pressure and vascular hardening. And they saw that elevated, in young people with high ACE scores. And finally, all of this kind of uh, gets under our skin or gets encoded through epigenetic modifications, right? Particularly 
exposure to early adversity is associated with changes in the way our DNA is read and transcribed. And this leads to long-term changes in the way that all of the cells in the body function, right? So we see changes in, uh, we see changes in the way that the brain responds to stress. And we also see changes in telomere length. Telomeres are the buffers on a, kind of the bumpers on the ends of our DNA that kind of protect them from damage. And that leads to premature cellular aging. So cells stop functioning as well or are more likely to go to cancer, right? So we have early life adversity that's mediated by protective factors as well as predisposed vulnerability. This leads to neuroendocrine immune disruption and all of the clinical implications we see. And with this understanding now, I could look at my patient a little differently and recognize, you know what, the thing that got him in the door was the ADHD, um, or what his teacher thought was ADHD. But when I saw him, I didn't recognize that kids who have a high history of adversity are actually more likely to have atopic disease, like eczema that he had, or that they're twice as likely to have asthma, right? All of a sudden, this entire picture for me was the clinical picture of a child with toxic stress with multi-system dysregulation. So once I figured out that this really was, you know, my patient was experiencing this toxic stress physiology, you know, I went uh, to uh, MD consult and I looked up the latest guidelines for treating toxic stress in children, downloaded it, and uh, implemented it in my clinic. That's a joke. <laughs> There are no guidelines. We have all the science. We, listen, we are far from understanding, right, every detail of every pathway of this mechanism. We are far from getting to the place where we can come up with, you know, a, a clinical or a pharmacological intervention that is going to dramatically change. We're far from the antiretrovirals of toxic stress. But if you go into almost any pediatrician's office in the United States of America, this science is not being used at all. It's ridiculous. I apologize for getting animated, but it just drives me crazy. It's so frustrating as a physician to try to figure out, OK, we just looked at the data and saw we have a huge percentage of our population, right? We have presumably one in eight Americans who have been exposed to four or more ACEs, and yet no doctor has any guideline of how we should do things differently. So the first thing that we started to do in my clinic, Bayview Child Health Center, was we said, okay, how much is this really affecting our patients? Let's, let's put it through the scientific paces. So we did a chart review of 700 patients to see if we could document, figure out their ACE scores. And what we found was that very similar to the ACE study, 67% of our patients had at least one ACE, and 12% had four or more. Uh, we also found that um, for our patients who did have four or more ACEs, they were twice as likely to be overweight or obese, and their odds of having learning or behavior problems in school were 32.6 times. For our kids, our black and brown kids in Bayview Hunters Point, if they had no ACEs, only 3% of them had learning and behavior problems. If they had four or more ACEs, more than half of them had learning and behavior problems. Clearly, we're seeing the neurologic symptomatology of exposure to early adversity. So the next thing that we did with this information, oh, the one important thing about this is different from the ACE study, where they were asking adults retrospectively, and they were asking folks in their 50s, our mean age in this study was eight years old, right? So um, the story has not been fully told yet. So we took this, um, took all of this information, and um, for me, I, it, it, I mean, it just, it changed my career. I, I left my role as the medical director of the Bayview Child Health Center and we created the Center for Youth Wellness in San Francisco. And it was, CYW was created to, 
to fill that gap. It was to leverage the science. By the way, when I uploaded this, all of a sudden the font changed. So please don't, I did not decide that this was like the most appropriate font for this conference. I, I just want to let you know, I was like, whoa. Um, so CYW was created at, um, based on the concept that early adversity profoundly impacts the health and development of our children, but not just our children, our children, our families, and our communities. So we were created to leverage the science on the biologic impact of early adversity to change national practice. We believe that with routine screening, early detection, and effective intervention, it's possible to interrupt the progression from early adversity to disease and early death. And our model is based on Essentially, I, it was so funny, Jack was talking about R&D, and I was like, the Center for Youth Wellness is essentially an R&D lab for addressing ACEs and toxic stress. And um, our, we have a clinical arm, a research arm, and a policy arm, and essentially the way that we do, I'm sorry, it, not policy, movement building, <laughs> movement building arm. And essentially what we do is uh, we generate new interventions, um, validate and share, right? That's just try to figure out what the heck can we be doing about uh, this problem. But one important thing that we realize is that it's not enough for us to come up with a clinical protocol for addressing ACEs, right? That is our number one focus and that's what we'll be looking at in the years coming. But we recognize that I still have all these teachers sending me all these kids for ADHD and they wanna understand why that kid isn't coming back to class with a prescription for Ritalin, right? So we need to do, I really take a public health approach to solving this public health crisis. That means primary prevention, raising national awareness, right? Secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is for folks who are exposed, right? How do you prevent them from getting the disease? They have the exposure, do they have uh, uh, the disease? Tertiary prevention is folk, fo for folks who are impacted, um, right? Uh, for folks who are impacted, how do we mitigate the impact and hopefully heal? So in terms of primary prevention, raising national awareness is key. We have to get the word out let, so that folks know and so that communities can come up with very wise ways for solving these, um, uh, for addressing these problems for themselves. Secondary prevention, Routine screening, right, so that we can do early detection and effective intervention. If we detect early enough, if we begin screening from birth or even prenatally, we have a much better opportunity to take advantage of some of these critical periods and neuroplasticity to, uh, for healing. Tertiary prevention right now is looking at current best practices, right? And we have some really good um, practices right now, home visiting, mental health, social work, two generation interventions. But we also need to invest in the uh, basic science, clinical and translational research that's gonna catalyze stepwise advances in the assessment of toxic stress and prevention of morbidity and mortality. And I, I'm, it's hard to take it seriously in that font, but uh, that's what needs to happen, right? But the good news is that this is happening, right? So the Berkeley Media Studies Group did a coverage report looking at media coverage of the term adverse childhood experiences. And we see that since 2011, there has been a seven-fold increase in media coverage of adverse childhood experiences. Now, listen, we're still down here compared to media coverage of things like diabetes and breast cancer and all the other things, but, but we're making progress, right? There has been an inversion uh, on that graph. And we're very fortunate to have amazing partners like Jamie Redford, who despite his incredibly famous dad, is so down. And he is a filmmaker who has made uh, a film called Resilience on Adverse Childhood Experiences and Toxic Stress. Some of the scientists in this room, I think Jack, you're in the film, aren't you? Where's Jack? Uh, um, uh, that premiered in January at the Sundance film, film Festival. So the word is coming out. As of uh, Monday, uh, two point, uh, just, just over two million folks 
had taken the time to spend 16 minutes out of their day to learn about how childhood trauma affects your health across a lifetime. And I'll have to say that far exceeded our expectations. We were hoping for a goal of a million, and we hit two million in just over a year. So what happens when those two million people go to their doctor's office and say, wow, you know what, I think that my child has been, uh, you know, has been witnessing violence in the home or has had a traumatic event. Doctor, you know, what can you do for me? And that's where the medical community needs to be ready to respond. And fortunately, the American Academy of Pediatrics has really been taking the lead on this. Last year had the first ever national conference on toxic stress and also had a uh, plenary day at the AAP national uh, meeting, the national conference and exhibition, where we had a full day on, um, on adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. And at that conference, uh, many of my colleagues came to me and said, you know, what can I do? We're not the Center for Youth Wellness. We're not an R&D lab for ACE and toxic stress. And I'll tell you what every single doctor, every single pediatrician, primary care doctor can do today. Screen, counsel, refer, right? If I'm in clinic and I lay my stethoscope on a chest and I hear a murmur, I don't have to be an interventional cardiologist to do something about it. My job in primary care is to detect and then get that patient to the right intervention. Screen, counsel, refer. And the other thing I heard from many of my colleagues is, well, how do we do that, right? I, when we started, we started just asking. I started, you know, um, in, in 2008, just asking my, my patients, has your child been exposed to any of these things? And over the past number of years, we've done quite a bit of iteration on this process. And what we hit on, actually, thanks to uh, the collaboration of some of the scientists in this room, Mark, where's Mark? Mark Raines uh, from Hopkins gave us a brilliant idea of doing a de-identified screen. And so we began piloting a de-identified screen where we said for the parents, you don't have to tell us which of these ACEs your child has experienced because that can take a long time to handle in the primary care setting. You only have to tell us how many. And with that ACE score, I can assess that child's dose of adversity and I know their relative risk of disease, right? I know if that number is a four, that that child is twice as likely to develop asthma. I know that they're uh, four times as likely to develop COPD, and I know they're 12 times as likely to attempt to take their own life. I know how to direct my resources to be able to address this issue. And not only do I have that, I have baseline data about the relative risk, and I can see, do my interventions actually reduce risk or not? So screen, counsel, refer. We developed our protocol and we ultimately codified this and made this available for other clinicians on our website. So this is the user guide for health professionals for the uh, ACEQ, uh, which is the screening protocol that we use. It's available on our website. Anyone can download it. And in fact, we've had almost 1,000 clinicians from around the world, actually. We were really surprised. The, uh, the website sends us the, the, uh, the link to where folks are downloading from. And uh, folks around the world have uh, downloaded the screening tool and are put it to use. And we are thrilled that just last week, actually, the National Institute for Child Health Quality included in their recommendations for promoting young children's socio-emotional development in primary care, right? The recommendations for primary care providers was uh, they included the ACE screening intervention as one of their promising practices. So, for at the very minimum, screen, counsel, refer, and we have a guide for how to do that on our website. But as I mentioned, we are essentially an R&D lab for addressing ACEs and toxic stress. And in our center, um, we are also trying to pilot, we're also implementing some of what are currently kind of the best practices, right? So we do our screening, we do a symptom assessment, anticipatory guidance, and then we also do the things that evidence shows can improve outcomes, things like home visiting, integrated primary care and behavioral health, uh, health education, nutrition, exercise, as well as some things that are promising practices like biofeedback and mindfulness training. And finally, there's a little, I have a little uh, in bold here, this um, 
this risk-based clinical management and tracking biological markers. Those are the two pieces that are under development right now. And when I talk about risk-based clinical management, what am I talking about? We know from the ACE study that uh, teenagers with a, a score of four or more are twice as likely, teenage girls are twice as likely to become pregnant as those with an A score of zero. And in fact, greater than 40% of uh, teen girls in the study who had an A score of four or more became pregnant. So we're developing a clinical protocol that says, if you have a teenage girl and she has an A score of four or more, she needs to be on long-acting uh, anti-contraceptive therapy unless there is a contraindication. These are the type of kind of basic clinical interventions that we're talking about. And we're using this to follow, uh, and then we're following, uh, doing follow-up on our outcomes. We're looking to see, does this make a difference? Can we reduce our teen pregnancy rate? We're looking at clinical indicators, which are both short-term outcomes and intermediate outcomes, including things like uh, BMI, uh, uh, bedwetting, dental health, teen pregnancy, et cetera. And in addition, we are advancing the science, and this is the next step. Um, we are in partnership with UCSF Medical Center and UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland, as well as the Terra Health Foundation. We have created the Bay Area Research Consortium on Toxic Stress and Health, and our, uh, we're just launching now a randomized controlled trial to validate the ACE screening tool. Uh, looking at the internal consistency as well as validity between the association between ACE scores and physical and behavioral health indicators, as well as biomarkers. Uh, we're looking at the association between ACEs and biomarkers of stress, and we're evaluating whether, hey, you know, do our interventions work? Whether a brief or intensive primary care-based intervention for children at risk for toxic stress can lead to detectable changes in the physiology of the stress response. So the, I am incredibly excited about all of this. However, we have to recognize, as I mentioned, even if we create the most amazing clinical intervention, even if we develop a pill that I can give to Diego that will, make, that will regulate his neuroendocrine immune system, right, unless we have an ecosystem of support, right, that will allow teachers and juvenile justice workers and all those people who for some reason are expelling children from preschool, right? Unless we are able to create an ecosystem of support, right, then we will not have movement on this public health intervention. When we see an issue of lead poisoning. It's not enough to be able to chelate lead out of the blood. You have to take lead out of paint. You have to take lead out of gasoline. You have to remove the environmental sources of lead. And you have to learn how to screen and detect um, lead. So in November of 2014, we organized California's first Adverse Childhood um, Experiences Summit to bring together stakeholders, because we believe California is a place where you can do this, right? So we brought together over 200 leaders from early childhood, health, juvenile justice, child welfare, education, and we had this big summit that, you know, was very, everyone was very excited about, sparked a movement across the state. And then through a collective impact model, we brought together 20 organizations to create a three-year statewide action plan. And that, uh, the key stakeholders included, you know, the Department of Justice, the Department of Public Health, uh, Health and Human Services, as well as hospitals like Kaiser Permanente and Rady Children's Hospital. Uh, we involved folks in the education space. So we had folks from an elementary school, as well as advocacy organizations like Zero to Three, First Five, and the Children's Defense Fund. But we didn't just bring folks together. We armed them with data. Right? So California had collected ACE data from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, and they never analyzed it. So we got it from the state, and Center for Youth Wellness, in partnership with Public Health Institute, was able to 
analyze the data down to the county level so that every one of the 53 counties in California knew the prevalence of ACEs in their community. And that has sparked quite a, a tremendous amount of local level uh, response to ACEs and campaigns. But what was also interesting about providing the data was that most folks thought that the areas with the highest prevalence of ACEs would be places like, you know, Oakland or, you know, LA. They were our rural Northern California counties. Everyone was shocked that the highest prevalence was in these rural areas. And ultimately, folks came together to pull this into an, a blueprint and an action plan for California's response to adverse childhood experiences. So what's next? We need a well-coordinated national public health campaign to address ACEs and toxic stress. We also need training for the next generation of practitioners. And absolutely, we need investments in the basic science, clinical, and translational research so that we can catalyze stepwise advances in the advancement of toxic stress treatment and the prevention of morbidity and mortality. Thank you.